Another edition of the PHNX Diamondbacks podcast, right on PHNX. My name is Derek Montia, occasionally known as your mayor of PHNX. This man next to me is occasionally known as your vice mayor of this same network. It's the one and only Thunderstick Jesse Friedman, who still doesn't know how to use his mute button. Jesse, <laughs> uh, ski to you. Uh, ski to you as well. Got another another day of Zach Gallon pitching, this time out at Peoria. Uh, results. Weren't great. Zach Gallon seemed to be cruising there for a while, uh, and then all of a sudden, couldn't seem to get anybody out. Yeah, it wasn't a it wasn't a great outing for Zach Gallon overall. Uh, first inning, he was he was able to get through without giving up a run. Through I think it was sixteen pitches, and he came back out for the second through twenty three pitches there. And the Diamondbacks eventually, Tori Lavello eventually just opted to get him out of the game. Uh, which is a thing you can do in spring training, which the Diamondbacks have certainly done a fair amount of in, in recent days. Uh, Gallon got two outs in the second and then uh, came back out uh, and was able to get through the third inning remarkably. He came he came in the third with 39 pitches and a pitch count for the day of 45. That's what Tori Lavella wanted, three innings and 45. So you figured coming into the third with 39, you probably weren't going to see Zach Allen finish that inning. But the Padres just came out and swung at absolutely everything. There was a defensive miscue in the frame. So he really he really got four outs in that in that third inning, uh, managed to do so on seven pitches. So uh, he was able to, to finish out that third. Uh, not great from a result standpoint, but again, it's it's spring training. Brandon Fott the other day said he wasn't showing off some of his best stuff on purpose. Is there a case where we might see that from guys like Zach Gallon and Merrill Kelly and Fott where, yes, they're going to go out there and pitch. Yes, the results might not be great. Obviously, Merrill Kelly, he his results were great in his last outing. But with Zach Gallon, like, is it is it possibility he's just not trying to show off his best stuff here during spring? 100%. And Zach Gallon was very open about that after the game facing a divisional opponent. You don't want to you don't want to show too much. And uh, he talked about really just throwing a whole bunch of fastballs and curveballs in this game. He threw, I think, two, three changeups, maybe. Uh, I think he threw one slider. So it wasn't the full the full arsenal from Gallon that we're used to seeing. And that was very intentional. Uh, we also talked with uh, Gallon and Tori Lovello about if the Diamondbacks considered not having Gallon start this game just because it was against the Padres. And the D-backs are probably going to, Zach yeah. Gallon's probably going to face the Padres a few times during yeah. the season. Uh, that was not, uh, they obviously were willing to to let him make this start anyway. But Tori Lovello did say that if the Diamondbacks were playing the Padres early in the season, they probably would have looked to, to rework this and keep Gallon from facing uh, from facing the Padres in spring training. So, yeah, that's a, that's a really big factor here that it was a divisional opponent and, and wanting to make sure that he didn't show too much, even though the D-backs don't play the Padres right out of the gate uh, in the regular season. This is what Zach had to say on his outing the day against those Padres. I mean, I felt, I felt okay. Um, uh, I mean, just obviously working on stuff, just a lot of fastball, curveball, trying to get those those two pitches right. Um you know, obviously it's a little different when you're facing team in your division. You kind of want to get the work in, but you don't want to, you know, give away too much of your hand. Um, so, yeah, I mean, felt okay with the way the curveball was where it was at. Um, fastball, I, I wasn't too thrilled. I felt like I was kind of pulling it and making it cut and just wasn't able to command it really well. Um, but made some pitches. Um, and, yeah, I mean, just, you know, it's spring. Yeah, it's, it's a work in progress. It is a work in progress. And of course, you know, again, there's there's uh, different objectives for different players and guys like Gallon, eh, you know, again, the there's certain things he's working on, like maybe his curveball command a bit and things like that, that he was yeah. trying to, you know, trying to lock in. But aside from that, really, really not trying to go out there and, and you know, definitely not trying to give up runs, but not trying to go out there and show <laughs> off his best stuff. 
Yeah, I, I don't think any pitcher is trying to give up Actively, runs yeah. in, in spring training. <laughs> that this is... will really confuse him if I <laughs> suck in spring. But he uh, did. He was good. It just like like all of a sudden he just he gets two outs in the second, and then it seemed like nothing was working for him anymore. And then, like you said, he's able to come back out in the third and and cruise. Yeah, I, there wasn't like a ton of hard contact. I I wouldn't say uh, he did give up the five hits, but. Yeah, there was a decent amount of soft contact, I think. There wasn't a ton of swing and miss. I think maybe one or two whiffs, uh, which I'm sure is something he would he would maybe like to see more of. I mean, that's always always something you're yeah. going to want as a starting yeah. pitcher, especially when you're working on curveball command, which he was today. Curveball, I thought, did, did look pretty decent in this game. Uh, Velo-wise, this was a confusing day for Zach Gallen uh, because it very much... His velo very much depends on whether you want to believe the in-stadium velo reading okay. or the broadcast velo reading. Mm. They were different by mm. about two or three miles an hour oh, through his entire lot. outing, which that's is a lot. lot. <laughs> yeah, so people were talking about on the broadcast how he was topping it. I think 91. is the, That's at least the highest I ever saw on the broadcast. Uh, in the stadium, we saw several 93s. So I'm not sure which one of those is correct. Uh, it very well could 93. be. I, I think it's probably one or the other. I, I don't know if it's like I, I would be kind of surprised <laughs> yes, if it was just taking the average of the, the two. Other. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know how these things one work. One of them but... has to be right, and one of them has to be wrong. They're not both wrong. Well, right? yeah, they're yeah, they're not they're not both right. I think we could definitely say <laughs> that. that. Too, that they're, too. they're not both right. Uh, yeah, I don't think they're both wrong either. One of them was probably accurate. I'm not sure which one. Um, but yeah, the, the velo is clearly either way. The velo is not where it was in the regular season last year. We talked about that after his first spring training start where I think he topped it 91 in that outing out in surprise that according to the stadium, uh, the stadium gun, cause that's all we had access to there. Um, so yeah, I mean, if, if it is that the, you know, the topping at 91, if that is accurate, then that, then his velo is down pretty pretty considerably and that's at least something to something to keep an eye on by the way what you just saw there was an example of how i mediate arguments with my wife oh, i nice. try to start nice. backwards by it getting us both to admit that neither one of us were right it's a it's a fair it's a good tactic it's, it's a good tactic yeah, you, you don't start with who this. was wrong you just say we were neither one of even us though were you right. know that you're right oh and she's wrong god damn right. right i know i'm right you know it i know it the whole time it's just a tactic i'm just trying to back her into admitting she's wrong um, anyway, Zach Gallen talked about if he reads the results of the outing at all. I know we try to say we don't, uh, or at least you do. I try to act like I'm a mature adult that doesn't overreact to spring training uh, outings. But this is what Zach was saying about the results and, and how he reacts kind of to the results of an outing like this. I, I pick some things, um, you know, probably, you know, stuff that might not show up in the box score. Um, you know, a two strike, two out walk to Higashio because probably a spot where it's like, you know, that the homer I'm not necessarily mad about. It's like I was in the strike zone, didn't make a great pitch. Um, you know, kid made a good swing, but yeah, the the, the two strike, two out walk, that's something like okay, I gotta, you know, it's gotta be addressed or, you know, um, you know, getting one zero or two zero and things like that. So the the hits and the runs and the things like that, it's like it's gonna happen. It is what it is. Um, but other things that I can control is kind of you know, what I look at and then go from there. And then on the positive side of it is like, okay, I feel like I commanded my breaking ball fairly well today. So um, kind of to me, it means like I'm, you know, heading in the right direction in terms of stuff I've been working on with the curveball. See, a mature reaction to his outing, something I'm go. not capable of giving. <laughs> he did. He did also talk about uh, how the adrenaline in these games is not, it's not quite the same as in a, in a regular season game, certainly, especially when you're not, really trying to sequence pitches the way that you normally would it kind of takes away from your competitive edge a little bit I, I would have to believe if you're like intentionally not using the best pitches at the best times like you want to um, convince yourself that it's competitive but just deep down inside you know it's not yeah he's at, zach described it as like trying to find other ways to get guys out right like if, if you're going to intentionally avoid throwing certain pitches or sequencing pitches in certain ways it's going to force you to be creative and do things you wouldn't normally do it's and good. he did say that there's benefit in that too and, yeah. and maybe in that process stumbling upon like oh this guy had a you know did not react well to the change up and you know in this spot in this sure. location or yeah. whatever and you know maybe that can actually help him during the regular season when when things do count well and that takes a step backwards to what tory said where he really wants to see how these guys react when things aren't going well for them. He doesn't want it 
to be when everything's perfect and everybody's locked in and dialed in. He kind of wants to see when these guys are struggling, how do they rebound? How do they dig deep and find a way to still get results, especially pitchers, right? Yeah. And I think for Zach, that could be important because, as we know, Zach often says he didn't have a good feel for his pitches tonight. Even when he goes out there and strikes out double digits and, and doesn't give up a run, he'll still say, I, I didn't feel, you know, I, I didn't have a great feel for this pitch or that pitch, right? So uh, it is good experience for him to try to be creative and figure out other ways. And that could come back to be a benefit for him, you know, during the regular season, during some of those outings. Uh, I, I, again, I, I would love to see Zach go out there and throw the way that we saw Merrill in his debut. Right. But again, yeah, these results aren't anything to put too much stock in and, uh, we'll re we'll, we'll remain cautiously optimistic that Zach Gallon will be where he needs to be by opening day. Yeah. The, the other thing I want to, I want to say here is that Zach Gallon wasn't particularly good last spring training either. Uh, and he also wasn't particularly good when the season started. Zach Gallen, I know it didn't end particularly well, and he didn't have the 2023 season that maybe he would have liked to. He was certainly better in 2022, but he was still a pretty darn good pitcher in 2023 and, you know, uh, finished up there in, in Cy Young voting, finished third in Cy Young voting. And you look at the way that he started even the regular season last year, if I can get these numbers to show up for me. Uh, <laughs> he did not pitch well against the Dodgers, right? On on opening day, he went four and two thirds, gave up six hits and five runs. His next time out against the Padres, he was able to get through six in that start, but it was a bit of a grind. He gave up uh, five runs, four earned in that one. And then he settled down and, you know, went out and struck out 11 over seven scoreless innings against the Brewers and went on a very, very nice run through the middle of the season and started the all-star game and all those things. That. So, even if even if Zach Gallen doesn't look right in spring training, really at any point, and even if in the regular season the first couple outings don't look all that great, we saw this last year, and we yeah. saw how it can turn around, and he can still have a pretty good season. So even if the results continue to be a little shaky, you know it, it is spring training. There's a lot of other factors at play here, as we've said, and even beyond that. He's shown that he has the ability to to turn things around in in a big way. You know, once the once the the real season gets underway. Well, we have another pitcher that did make his debut and did absolutely shove in his debut, and that is the returning Corbin Martin. Pitched a scoreless inning today, looked absolutely outstanding, and again, a guy that we have touched on a few times this spring so far that could be a true X factor for the bullpen. Uh, just just a name that people have. I think forgotten a little bit about a name that people don't really know uh, one, if he can stay healthy and two, if he can return to form of when he was kind of a big, he was a big piece of that, that trade that the Arizona Diamondbacks completed, you know, for Zach Granke. So obviously he is a guy that, you know, we want to see hopefully still contribute based on the way he pitched today. It looks like he absolutely could be that for this team. Yeah, the, the stuff I thought looked good. Uh, I published a story last night, five Diamondbacks players flying under the radar in spring training, and uh, Corbin Martin was was one of them, and probably out of any of the five, I would say has the best chance to like really impact the Diamondbacks in, in 2024. This was the first time that he stepped out on a mound and pitched like in front of an actual audience since I believe it was March 15th of last year, almost Sheesh. a year ago right now. Uh, he was pitching in the rain at a night game at Salt River Fields and was in the most pain of his life as his, oh, a, a, you know, a significant ligament in his shoulder tore and it did not feel good. He told me that he felt like he was shot with a gun, uh, that, that that is sort of the sensation he had in that moment. And yeah, it was a really, really big moment for him today, getting back on the mound and, and pitching pretty, pretty well. Again, uh, really hope that we can see him be a big part of this bullpen. Like you said, a guy that can make this team. Uh, and honestly, a, a guy that we don't, we, we, we really don't know yet how big of a piece of this bullpen he could be, but it could be huge for this team. Um, but I don't really care, uh, because this is boring now. Spring training is boring. Now we've gotten <laughs> to the play, point of spring training being boring. I think fans are bored. I think every, I think the problem is, is that we're getting down to that point of spring training where we just want to get to the regular season, uh, spring training, much like the baseball regular season is entirely too long. And, uh, you know, here we are just smack dab kind of in the middle of it. Uh, we got what the two weeks from this Thursday when regular season games are concerned or, or get started for the Diamondbacks. We got the soul series uh, for the Dodgers before that. But are, are the players getting bored, Jesse? Are they as bored as I am of this? 
Well, I asked Tori Lovello about that today, and here is, I guess I specifically asked Tori Lovello, the question was, do you feel like players are just ready for the real thing at this point? And uh, here is what he had to say. Yeah, I think we're getting pretty close to that, sure. to be honest with you. Um, we, ran, we ran some high-intensity bump plays today. I loved what I saw. The guys got after it. We had actual butters, um, and we did a lot right. And I could tell they did it really well for about nine minutes, and then they think they got a little bit bored. When I start to see that, I think they're ready for the next challenge. So, um, yeah, I know they could probably tell you they're ready for a game, but nobody's built up to nine innings. So we got to get them there. Start with seven, and eventually be nine, but uh, well, close to nine. They will probably won't play a full game, but yeah, I think we're right about there, that point where let's start the real thing. <laughs> they they want to start the real thing. We all want to start the real thing. But uh, circling back to Corbin Martin, Tim wanted to know uh, what his velo was like today. Yeah, I unfortunately we were in the clubhouse talking with Zach Gallen when Corbin Martin was pitching, uh, but I did go back and and watch the pitches on the broadcast. And again, there's this discrepancy between broadcast velo. Oh yeah, and, the broadcast and, and velo. Was, velo. So what was the broadcast velo? Uh, I want to say it was. I don't. I don't remember. I'd have to go back and and double check. I saw. I think I saw a 96 uh, in the stadium, and I think I saw somewhere in the mid 90s on the broadcast. I'm not sure exactly. I was going to say the you saw 96 were. based on the the rate of exchange. That would mean you'd like a 98, 99 almost. Yeah, well, I, yeah, the 96, I believe, was in the stadium. And in the stadium was running a couple ticks higher okay. than on the broadcast. Okay. So, I, yeah, I don't think that means 98 necessarily, but I don't know. It, unfortunately, with that kind of discrepancy, it's hard to speak with any kind of confidence <laughs> right, about right. below readings. Who, 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 who's to say? Right. Uh, do you think Corbett Martin is the guy that Tori was talking about having the jump in velocity? <laughs> We've been trying to figure that out for like a month now. Haven't yeah, we? yeah. Uh, <laughs> I would, I would guess probably not because Corbin Martin already was, had decent velo. Yeah, I mean, last spring Story training, Corbin Martin touched ninety eight in a yeah, game. Yeah. I think maybe yeah. multiple times was it averaging close to ninety seven. So I think last okay. year Corbin Martin's velo was was uh, was definitely up there. I, I kind of doubt that uh, that he was the guy, but. I don't know if we're ever going to get the answer we're to that question. I, because Tori, we don't even know if it's true. Yeah, and at this point, Tori probably won't even like remember that he said that, <laughs> which is totally understandable. So I don't know if we'll ever if we'll ever know. But speaking of Tori, here's what he had to say about uh, Corbin Martin's debut today. It's a great moment for this organization to get him back out there and an especially great moment for Corbin Martin to get back on the field and throw the way he did. So um, the catcher was very complimentary. Tucker Barnard was very complimentary of his stuff. And, it's just a great moment. Two two big time injuries where he's missed a year of time, uh, and I, you know I congratulated him. It was very well deserved. But the stuff was really good too. He said he was really nervous. He should be right as he should be. Um, I don't know if he told you this is the first place he pitched after his arm surgery. I don't know. Yeah, he shared that with me. I don't. I don't. I'm sure it's true, but I didn't. Not, not a lot of people know that. But he. Um, he got back on the mound and executed pitches and fearlessly went out there and um, and took care of business. And we're, we're all proud of him for that. It's, it's a long journey. Does the stuff look like it did? I think so. The fastball looked like it had a really good ride and carry. Um, secondary stuff, I'm sure he's still going to fine tune, but Tucker Barnard said it's real electric stuff. And when you're coming back off an arm injury and you're letting it go the way he was, there's a lot that went right, and we're proud of that. Do you think it means he worked out in pure? Because like, yeah, Tori, this <laughs> I don't is know. His I, debut, that comment so. is confusing to me. Yeah, uh, I think it means he worked out there probably the first time he actually threw at some point after his surgery was there at Peoria, probably in a some sort of workout or bullpen or something. Yeah, like that. I don't know. Yeah. Going back to twenty, I mean, I, I was thinking maybe he's talking about the last time he had surgery when he had Tommy John surgery and was coming back from that. Uh, he, he, I guess 2021 spring training would have been his first ah, outings back from that. that. Could and he did well. pitch in Peoria once, but that was his third outing in 2021. So yeah, maybe it was like a backfield appearance in, in Peoria at some point over the off season. I'm not totally sure, but one interesting question with Corbin Martin is, can he actually be ready for opening day? Mm -hmm. And we asked Tori that before the game started and Tori wasn't totally sure. Uh, he, he seemed to. He seemed to suggest it was possible that Corbin Martin will not be ready for opening day. He didn't give a confident answer one way or another, but he 
he I think that is that is very much in play here that the Diamondbacks will not be able to have Corbin Martin on their opening day roster regardless of how how good he looks in these games and I I do think he looked pretty good today um they're just slow playing it they're they are yeah. taking their time with Corbin Martin you can understand why he had Tommy John surgery a few years ago he just had a pretty major shoulder surgery Right, you've had a, a major elbow procedure and a major shoulder procedure. He's thrown just over 38 major league innings uh, since coming over to the D-backs five years ago. Uh, so they they want to be careful here. They want to set him up for success, and if it means him not being ready for opening day, I, I think that's I think they're okay with that. They know they're going to need depth as the season progresses. So, sure. like you said, yeah, absolutely, him not being there opening day, just like a lot of guys not being on the opening day roster does not mean that they won't play a vital role for the major league team at some point. It's just a matter of making sure that you have them, you know, somewhere where they can continue their progression to being a hundred percent, being ready to pitch at a major league level while still not impacting the success of the team. Right. Can't, you know, and, and, and again, with like Corbin Martin, it's, it's about his long-term health. They, they, yeah. they're investing in him. They want to make sure that this guy can get back to, you know, playing full time and not have to worry about the risk of injury. Uh, and it's always going to be there for him with those two surgeries. Those are not easy surgeries to recover from. You know, I think yeah. we're just so used to it now. We're so used to guys going and having Tommy John surgery and, you know, thoracic outlet surgery and having pieces of their body removed and replaced <laughs> and all that. And we're like, why can't you throw 97 anymore? What happened to you? Well, you know, his arm's been basically recreated by science so you know <laughs> speaking of thoracic outlet uh ryan thompson brought his uh his rib necklace into Jesse the, into the clubhouse i did not touch the rib i simply held the necklace uh, from the top yeah, like, did not touch the rib that would have been weird you touched the rib <laughs> <laughs> i don't care if you were holding that chain you touched the rib uh but yes he he did bring it Is in, it in and a he little was, jar he was, no no it's just attached yeah it's just attached wow yeah, yeah how big is a, it uh, it was maybe like oh, little, maybe like that. Fella? Yeah, Aww. I mean, it, yeah, it's not it's not like one of the big ribs. It's like, adorable. It's, yeah, it's it's maybe like two two inches, it's something like, a short like rib, that, if you will. It's, it's a short, short, rib, you know? short. Yeah, yeah. Right. yeah. Anyway, there you go. Uh, that's incredibly gross, but I think that's awesome. <laughs> uh, I'd love to have bones from my body made into jewelry. That sounds pretty baller. But <laughs> anyway, we do appreciate you guys being here in the PHNX uh, sports chat right now. Uh, Marcos is asking, uh, he said, just popped in the chat. Where's the sun, Derek? It's this goddamn light shining in my face, Marcos. That's I, what's wait, I wish sun. I had my shady See, he wants right his now. sunglasses yeah. on, too. I'm the <laughs> smart one on this set. Don't forget it. But anyway, we appreciate Marcos and Cogs and all of you guys for being here right now in the PHNX Sports YouTube channel. Of course, if you haven't subscribed to the channel yet, make sure to do so now. Sign up for notifications. That way you don't miss whenever we go live. Drop us a like. Gabby would love it if you did that. Uh, if you're listening on the audio podcasting side, make sure you uh, subscribe over there. Leave us a review. We always appreciate when you do that. Uh, and make sure uh, you, you, you let us know how you, how you like the show. We always appreciate the feedback. Uh, speaking of feedback, uh, prize picks right now. Great place for you to take all this information and utilize it uh, to have some fun with prize picks. Prize picks, uh, there's no shortage of high stakes basketball moments this time of year. And baseball, of course, is right around its corner. Get in on the excitement with Prize Picks, America's number one fantasy sports app, where you can turn your knowledge into serious cash. Prize Picks is really simple to play. You can make your picks and submit your entry in less than 60 seconds. Quick withdrawals, easy gameplay, and an enormous selection of players and stat types are what make Prize Picks the number one daily fantasy sports app. All you got to do is pick higher than or less than, more, more than or less than for these stats. Uh, and if you are correct, you will bring home some money. Just go to prizepicks.com slash PHNX and use our code of PHNX for a first deposit match up to $100. That's prizepicks.com slash PHNX and use that code of PHNX. Pick more, pick less. It's that easy. Great way to secure that money you make over at Prize Picks is to open up an account with our people over at Desert Financial Credit Union. For more than 84 years, Desert Financial has been Arizona's largest, most trusted local credit union. Of course, uh, their Desert Financial team are financial experts who are committed to their members and the community, offering financial solutions tailored to help real people achieve their financial goals and dreams. So uh, you can look to Desert Financial for checking in savings accounts, mortgages, loans, credit cards, investment options, and so much more. When you open a free checking account online, you can get $200 in bonuses. Get started by visiting desertfinancial.com slash 200. All right. Well, 
I think uh, we are going to have a conversation that a lot of people are going to consider to be perhaps a, a slight, a smidge uh, premature. However, uh, I'm ready to <laughs> no. get into it. I'm ready to. I'm ready to overreact. I'm ready to make enemies. I'm ready uh, to to do what we do here on Tuesdays because you know the thing we do on Mondays. Well, on Tuesdays it's Tear Maker Tuesday, and we are going to do a little ranking of some of the best catchers. Or I guess all the catchers. How are we? We'll we'll get to this tomorrow. We're going to rank some catchers, but before that. Uh, we do want to propose the question uh, to you guys. If you think Gabby Moreno is already the best catcher in Diamondbacks history. Yeah, and I think it's important to to just kind of set the table here. I think we can all agree that Gabby Moreno needs to post for another few years before he could possibly be deemed Fine. the best catcher in Diamondbacks Fine. history. I, I think the conversation we're having today is do we expect that when all is said and done, Gabby Moreno Bingo. will go down as the best catcher in Diamondbacks history uh, to date, like uh, sort of up until his up until and through his tenure as the primary catcher in this organization. Uh, and there is a fairly strong case for that. Uh, I do want to just start, though, with a few numbers from his 2023 season just to kind of capture how good Gabby Moreno was in 2023. The guy won a Gold Glove Award, which he is did. a pretty good place to start in your first full season. Uh, he slashed 284, 339, 408, seven homers, 50 RBI. He was worth 4.3 B-War, which is uh, very, very good. I believe Adley Rutschman is the only catcher in baseball. Uh, who is that high? I think he also had 4.3 B war. So Gabby Moreno was tied for the league lead among catchers uh, in baseball reference war in his first full season. And uh, that's pretty impressive. Uh, fan graphs, uh, I guess we're being a little selective here. Fan graphs, uh, if you go over to their war calculation, Gabby Moreno is not not near the top. Uh, they, their, um, their method of evaluating defense is a, is a big difference there. But I think we can all agree that Moreno was very, very good in his first full season and especially... Absolutely especially toward the end. And uh, obviously, you, like you said, a big part of this is the fact that he has not been doing it for long enough. And I, I will concede that point. I know a lot of people are going to say like, uh, you know, and, that, and that's what baseball is. Baseball is uh, a, a game where what separates the, the elite players, the excellent players, is their ability to do it for year in, year out. You know, uh, they, all players are going to go through things. All players are going to slump. They're all going to experience injuries. But you know, if a player is to be considered one of the best at their position, time needs to be involved. And that's the one thing here that Gabby doesn't really have. But like Jesse said, does he does he have the potential based on what we've seen out of him to be one of the Diamondbacks best catchers in history? And I, I think most people would answer that question. Yes. Yeah. I don't think that that's, 100%. Uh, it's it's like you'd be hard pressed to find a Diamondbacks fan that does not think very highly of Gabby and isn't very excited about having him as our franchise catcher of the future. Right. Uh, but we got to see him do it uh, a little bit more. We got to see him do it. And I think we will continue to see him get better. He just seems like that kind of guy, not to mention the fact that he delivered a cold ass line like he did the other day when they were asking him about throwing uh, runners. Why, out. why do runners continue yeah, to, why to they, go on you? Yeah. Yes. And he basically said, I understand it. Teams are trying to win, but I won't let them. He said, I won't let them. Just, yeah, I, I won't, won't I them. won't allow it. I yeah. won't allow it. Yeah, I won't allow it. That's a cold ass line. So uh, let's get to it, though. Uh, Damon, can we get our tier maker board up? Let's let's uh, let's get to the tier making. Where are we at? All right. Here we go. Um, here we have uh, 13 catchers from the Diamondbacks uh, franchise history. Uh, one one thing that all of these guys have in common. They were all what 100 these are yeah we narrowed it down to catchers who have who have caught 100 games Correct. as a member of the diamondbacks and have also played multiple seasons right uh so with, uh, with gabby being the only one here technically that hasn't yet yeah that's but. fair yeah technically guess what the way i said that gabby moreno wouldn't belong but gabby moreno is presumably going to play Played a lot of season? games in 2024 yeah. right. so i think right, we're I, I think we're pretty safe there um are we <laughs> are we are we confident enough here to just address gabby right now and put him in the s tier are we putting him in the s tier oh, you're just gonna you're just gonna go straight there huh? i mean he, i figure why should we should we do gabby last i mean we this is what the people want to know let's get to it i don't want to make them wait i'm not one of those shows let's get to this is gabby 
an S tier catcher for the Arizona Diamondbacks. All right. So, so a few things here. So Gabby Moreno worth 4.3 B war last year, as we just said with that season alone, he already is tied for fourth in Diamondbacks history in B war <laughs> after one season. Uh, the only, there are three, there are three players ahead of him on that list. Uh, Chris Snyder at 4.6. He is third. Damian Miller at 5.9. He is second. And then number one, who I know a lot of people have already mentioned in the chat, Miguel Montero at 13.6. Miguel Montero is far and away the leader in B-War for, for Diamondbacks catchers all time. There's no doubt about that. Um, so, yes, if you if you sort of extrapolate Gabby Moreno's 2023 season out for another you know, five more seasons, which is what, how many he would Chris play before Snyder's, hitting free agency. Chris, Chris Snyder is 2004 to 2010. Damian Miller, 1998 yeah. to 2002. Miguel Montero, 2006 to 2014. Gabriel Moreno is an S tier catcher. Period. If he's already caught up to these guys and he's this close. Yeah, he's not. I mean, he's not caught up in total war. But yes, if he were to put up like four more of the seasons he just had based on baseball reference war, he would be number one. He would surpass. Yeah. Uh, Miguel Montero, who had more seasons here in, in that time frame. So uh, he is an S-tier catcher for this franchise. We're, we're doing it, huh? We're yeah. just putting Gabby Moreno in S-tier. I'm All doing right. it. Okay. I'm All doing right. it. I'm doing it. I'm doing it. I guess the only thing that would not knock him down to A-tier would be the, the idea there that he's only done it for one season. Yeah. Right? And, and with is that... that yeah, and I think that's a valid point, and some people may be angry of, uh, with us putting him in S already, but... I think we all feel pretty confident how this is going to turn out, right? It, it's, you know, injuries obviously can happen. You know, uh, regression can obviously happen. But the player that we saw in the second half last year, I mean, Moreno just got better as the season went on, yeah. right? When he came back from injury, if you go August 11th to the end of the playoffs, Gabby Moreno slash 286, 356, 478. Those are pretty freaking good numbers. And you combine that with the defensive player that he is. Correct. That is a very, very, very good player. So, yes, we need to see it longer. Uh, but I, I feel pretty confident that he will be at the top of this list when all is said and done. Of the 13 players here, and this is easy because it's only one season, so it's easier for him to have the highest OPS plus. But he has the highest OPS plus of 104. That is also true. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Gabby Moreno had a 104 OPS plus last year. And yeah, even Miguel Montero was just behind him at, at 103. So uh, that would put Miguel Montero moving on from Gabby, probably also into the S tier. Is that bit? Is that? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, wait, yeah. are we are we ranking this in terms of like these catchers in Diamondbacks franchise history? Or are we are we are we ranking them in relation to MLB? Because yeah, that, I feel like that's, that's two question. different things, right? Because if we're talking about MLB, then I probably wouldn't put Gabby necessarily in the S tier yet. But when we're talking about Diamondbacks franchise history, I think Miguel Montero belongs there. It has to be D-backs history. Right. Yeah. That's what I feel like. And I feel like Miguel Montero belongs in the S tier. Yeah. Am I wrong there? No, I think that's fair. Okay. You can't, you can't put Miguel montero lower than gabby moreno at Correct. this point Correct. maybe there will come a day when gabby moreno has actually you know showed this for long enough that we feel comfortable saying like yes he is actually a step above the player that miguel montero was for all those years but it, yeah it's definitely too early to, to do that miguel montero was an all-star and a very very good player for the diamondbacks for several seasons so next up, the other guys that you mentioned there that are essentially above Gabby and in B War are Damian Miller and Chris Snyder. Uh, Damian Miller, famously uh, not in any b baseball video games, and will never be, thanks to his uh, scab status with the MLBPA. Uh, <laughs> but a uh, very good pitcher for the Arizona or pitcher catcher uh, for the Diamondbacks in his <laughs> he time. He probably here. pitched a few innings. He here probably and there, did. Right? Yeah, definitely <laughs> pitched a few innings. But uh, he was just a very good guy. Like he was. He, he was kind of the definition of a catcher that did his job, kind of like Christian yeah. Walker at first base. Like, he did his job, um, and he was good at it, but, uh, it, like, he kind of got overshadowed by the other stars on this team, and Damian Miller didn't really get, you know, kind of the love. Also, the whole scab thing. That also probably made his career 
uh, a little a little unfortunate for him but uh, i couldn't even find a picture of him i had to do a ping myself look at this his head's so big oh, compared that's to everybody why, else that's why he looks yeah like he's not part else. of the pa okay. so you cannot find a picture of him steroid kelly's, era? kelly's anyone? Danette was also hard to find what's that i said steroid era anyone yeah well starting to get some rumors going about damian miller because of the size of his head compared to everybody oh, else yeah, yeah, yeah everybody yeah. else on this list yeah for, that, for that makes sure. a lot of sure. no well, let's not do that but <laughs> it's like are uh, we making steroid <laughs> accusations about damian miller i am solely based off of the this size headshot. of his head <laughs> four seasons for this team 5.9 b war 93 ops plus yeah, Damian Miller was a was a good player. I mean, you look back at uh, he was just just consistently solid for the Diamondbacks in 1998, their inaugural season. He played 57 games at a 783 OPS, um, a 104 OPS plus, so above league average offensively. And you know, year after year, he was just you know right around the 90 to 95 OPS plus range, a solid hitter. Yeah. And uh, he also is uh, you know he also was he did win a World Series as was just mentioned in the chat. He did uh, that that definitely bears mentioning and defensively he graded out fairly well uh, if you just look at defensive war damian miller is tied for second on this list uh just 0 0.5 behind miguel montero in about half as many games so uh, i think you know defensively at least the numbers look pretty good there I, I think he he belongs near the top here derek where do we where do we want to put him i think a tier is absolutely fair i mean i would be even willing to entertain the s tier uh conversation and the only reason why is because like what you said there if, if miguel montero is up there damian miller might belong up there and then you factor in that world series and again damian miller was catching two legends back there behind the plate right uh so like uh not to mention he was helping batista get miguel batista get through some of those games as well but uh <laughs> let's you know let's give credit where credit's due i mean that was uh you know he he was uh, a solid solid defender back behind the plate for this team and and a big reason why they did win that world series yeah i think i think a tier makes sense for damian miller uh i guess that brings us to chris snyder sure and we're having the chris snyder conversation uh damon was telling me earlier that one jacob franklin was was convinced that chris snyder was like like clear, clearly s tier is, Clear, is that what he, he, was, is clearly, that what he was trying to say he said clearly s -tier. jacob franklin has been uh, put under a spell by his childhood <laughs> where mm -hmm. he is in a place where Chris Snyder was a staple of his of his life when he was 10 years old and he yeah. can't get over it. That nostalgia is a hell of a narcotic, Jesse. It's a hell of a <laughs> drug to kick. Um, so I'm between A and B for Chris Snyder. Uh, Chris Snyder just behind Damian Miller on the all-time war list at 4.6. He Eight. caught... 88 um, OPS plus Jesse yeah 88 OPS plus Damian Miller was at 93 during his D-backs days so the offense grades out a bit worse than Damian Miller uh defensively if I can find those numbers here uh defensively he's at 3.6 D war and he played a few more games than Damian Miller Damian Miller was also at 3.6 so defensively they're kind of similar Chris Snyder wasn't quite as good offensively as Damian Miller doesn't have the World Series on his resume obviously um so I would lean toward B here. Same. Okay. Same. Agreed. Let's throw him in the B tier. There's not a huge difference between Damian Miller and Chris Snyder, but the fact that Damian Miller is the numbers are a little bit better there, and the fact that he was on the World Series team, you know, maybe that kind of puts him over over the edge and and uh, and makes him A tier. All right, Damon. Let's do a B tier for Chris Snyder. Uh, that brings us up to Carson Kelly. Okay. Carson right. Kelly. <laughs> I mean, well, well, 2023 Carson Kelly was was not exactly a top tier catcher. No, uh, but we're already here at Carson Kelly. That I mean, stinks, man. What we're already <laughs> to Carson Kelly? Yeah, is he hey, fifth? Stop, <laughs> stop. Yeah, is I he mean, fifth? he he is he is tied with Gabby Moreno for the all time uh, WAR leader on the all time WAR leaderboard for D backs catchers at 4.3. Of course, he did that in you know about three to four times as many games as Gabby Moreno needed to do that. Uh, but you know what? Carson Kelly was not good in 2023. Obviously, he came back from the injury. The D-backs were expecting a big boost, getting him getting him back, the veteran presence, a guy who knows how to handle the pitchers and all that. Um, and he just wasn't that. And the yeah. Diamondbacks moved on from him, and that went the way that it did. Uh, but I think it's important to... Uh, it's important to look at the larger picture with Carson Kelly and acknowledge that there was a time... When everyone listening to the show has been a Diamondbacks fan for a while, 
really liked Carson Kelly and thought he was going to be one of the best, <laughs> one of the better young catchers in the game for a long time. Sorry, Maria's um, here. Maria's here. I got excited because Maria is back. Maria, we missed you. It's our favorite Dodgers fan. Suck it, Mo. Uh, <laughs> Maria, welcome back to the party. We are ranking Diamondbacks catchers in franchise history, the best Diamondbacks catchers in franchise history. Uh, not to cut you off, I will say this about Carson Kelly. Carson Kelly is one of those guys that came over in a trade, right? Yep. A trade we will not discuss again after yesterday. Uh, but a trade well, we didn't really discuss. I guess we did. We did. <laughs> we did. I mean, we we didn't discuss the trade all that much, but we did talk okay. about Paul Goldschmidt yeah. and said. Uh, anyway, I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna. I said say we're not gonna more. address it. We were moving on. <laughs> um, the point being, though, is that Carson Kelly is one of those guys that made an immediate impact and then was never as good again as he was that first season when he came over and joined the team. And I think that the the recollection of his time with the Diamondbacks is based on the fact that when he came over, this like, and I hate to say this, but this could be like Gabby Moreno, right? We have that first season where he's so good and we're already ranking him as an S tier catcher. Yeah. And then we see a massive drop off and then we never perhaps in his career ever see him have as good of a season as he has that first year. Carson Kelly had an 826 OPS in his first season with the Arizona Diamondbacks. Yeah, and he good. played a lot. He played in 111 games. That was the most games he played in, and that was his highest OPS. It was his highest batting average. It was his best season. And then everything after that was kind of mediocre. The 2021 season was fairly good. He, he, he slashed pretty, 240. He was pretty good in 2021. Yeah, 240, 343, 411 with a 754 OPS. But outside of that, he was never really better than league average if even that right so like yeah carson kelly is a guy i think that we we like a lot and carson kelly was a guy that i think we did see as our franchise catcher but when you are taking a look at the way that this you know uh, you know historically kind of stacks up i have a hard time putting carson kelly uh above kind of a, a c-tier catcher for this team yeah, I mean, I, the full body of work from Carson Kelly offensively is really not as bad as people probably think it is. He had a 713 OPS altogether with the Diamondbacks and a 92 OPS plus. Like for a catcher, you'll take that, yeah. right? Like that's not that's not bad for yeah. a catcher. And, you know, I don't think Carson Kelly was ever defensively the guy that people maybe hoped he would be when he was coming up in the Cardinal system. The narrative was that he was going to be a very, very good defensive yes. catcher. And yeah. it was just a matter of getting the the offense to be enough. Yeah. Uh, when in reality, it, it almost played out the opposite where his offense was, was really an asset at times. Yeah. And defensively, I, I don't think he was bad, but I don't think he was ever, you know, a, a well above average defensive catcher. He was kind of just average, uh, you know, maybe a little bit below average. Well, probably below average defensively mm -hmm. in what we in what we saw last year. So uh, going back to the to the tier list here, I don't think I can put Carson Kelly lower than B. Okay. I think you're looking at his numbers compared Fair. to Chris Snyder's numbers. Yeah, he had if, B. if Chris Snyder is B, then yes, I, I agree that Carson Kelly should probably be B. Yeah. Right. On a on a rate basis, Carson Kelly was producing war actually at a at a better rate than than Chris Snyder, and he also had a slightly better OPS plus in his time with the D backs. So I think I think it it fits well with them in the same category there. Beef Wellington Castillo. There you go. I got a hashtag going called Beef Mode. When Did he you? was part of the Diamondbacks that the Diamondbacks started using. <laughs> well, of course, everyone was aware of that. I was fairly. Jesse and I remember. That was, uh, that was a good times, good days. Neither one of you remember. Do not play. That was no, do no, not. I don't. I, that do took not the world over. To me. <laughs> um, but because of that, he's an S tier catcher. No, I'm joking. But uh, Wellington Castillo didn't play for the Diamondbacks for very long, but he did made, uh, I think, a pretty significant impact on this team uh, in a short amount of time. Uh, he had 100 OPS plus. Uh, 3.6 B war in two seasons. And uh, again, really came in and, and was just a, a lot of, a lot of power behind the plate for this team. Yeah. He, he could hit man. Uh, could you hit. know, the, the defense with Wellington Castillo is never, that was, that was never the, the selling point. Right. Uh, but Wellington Castillo is a diamond back slash 261, 320, 452. Mm -hmm. uh, his OPS plus was right at a hundred, which for a catcher is, is pretty good to be a league average hitter. Uh, he had 31 homers, drove in 118 and 193 games in the 2015 and 2016 seasons combined. So, yeah, he could hit a little bit. Uh, you know, technically by OPS plus, he's the third best catcher 
in in Diamondbacks history, at least for those who meet the the criteria to be on this list. Uh, Miguel Montero and Gabby Moreno are the are the only two ahead of him. So. Uh, yeah, I don't know. Where, where do you think that, where do you think that puts us? What do you want to do here? I want to put him in the A tier and I think you're not going to let me put him in the A tier. I want to put him in the A tier. I don't think you're going to let me do that. I don't know. Is this crazy? Am I crazy? That's insane. Well, okay then B. So I, I, my initial reaction is that that's insane, but Wellington Castillo put up 3.6 war in 193 games. Carson Kelly put up 4.3 but in 384 games. Mm-hmm. So Wellington Castillo is mm-hmm. actually on a, on a rate basis. A Give better me catcher. Wellington Castillo longevity in the A tier. Ha- longevity has to mean Give something. Give him in though. the A tier. We have Gabby Moreno in the S tier. Don't talk to me I don't about think longevity. We, can, we, can't put, we can't put Wellington Castillo in the A tier. Oh my I don't God, think you just can. said it. No, you just said if Carson Kelly got that war in double the amount of games, why, why, not? why not? Why not? Why not? Explain to me why not. And explain it to me like I'm five. Yeah, that's fair. Oh. We don't we don't want to be Craig. It's against our will. Craig's, We're being held here against Craig's, our will. Craig's telling us there's pizza here, and he's not letting us go eat said delicious pizza. But I just don't think that Wellington Castillo Stop was even was respected enough defensively for me to put him piece in the A tier. All right, fine. Then put him in the B tier. I think Get we have him, to put him out of the C tier now. All right, but yes, for those of you saying like you're ranking some of these guys really high. I, I guess we should reiterate we are doing this relative to other Diamondbacks catchers. Correct. Like we're we're not yeah, I'm not here to say that Wellington Castillo was like a great catcher necessarily, Correct. but from what we've had over the years in Arizona, I think I think B tier is pretty fair. It's insane that there's three good players on that entire list. I just have to say yeah. that longevity does have to matter. Like Wellington Castillo played two seasons for the Diamondbacks. Yeah. That, that's I don't, another that's I don't really care about case, the rate yeah. basis when you've played such a little amount of time. Sure. How long have you That's been fair. here? A Diamondbacks lifer? No. Uh, here. Within months with of my this, chi- of this my company. my birth. What is he talking about? I don't care. About, we just said we don't care about what you did on other teams. Just on this team. Just on this team. This was my my rookie year was on this team. I know. All I've ever done was on this. I team. know. I know. You got a lot of Roy votes for sure. But all right. Um, there's a lot of guys on this list that I think just belong immediately in the D tier. Okay. All right. Can we Let's, just do that? Can we sure. rapid fire? Sure. Sure. Who Rod Barajas. Yeah, that's probably fair. D tier. Yeah, he's he's well into the negatives from a from a war <laughs> perspective. Uh, minus two point one on on Baseball Reference from nineteen ninety nine to two thousand three. He just couldn't hit, man. A five ninety one OPS, a forty eight OPS plus. Forty eight um, OPS plus. You know, defensively, I think I think fairly fairly well respected there, but uh, offensively, you know, for that era, a five ninety one OPS was pretty. That that's that's pretty rough. I hate to do this because he's a great baseball name, but Tuff, Tuffy's got to go in D two. Another negative war yeah. guy. Negative. Uh, 0.6 war an even lower ops plus 41 ops plus yeah toughy tough yeah you're right great baseball name uh, great some, baseball some cool name. some cool moments along the way for sure uh but yeah he offensively he he really never uh he he has the lowest ops and ops plus on this list by a fairly considerable margin so yeah he's definitely d tier it's shocking that he caught over 100 games for the diamondbacks yeah, it's not. Yeah, it's not or, or exactly. No, he, he didn't catch over a hundred ever. Oh yeah, yeah, he did. Not in a single season. Yeah, not yeah. in a single season. But total, he was at one hundred and twenty six games. So sure. yeah, I mean, Tuffy was really, a, you know, he was really a, a backup catcher at least the the majority of the time. You know, if Tuffy was your front line catcher, that probably wasn't a wasn't a great sign. I have one more D tier catcher. Who do you got, Alex Avila, for disappointing me? <laughs> Was Alex Avila not a huge disappointment as a member of this team? Did he not come over and look like he was going to be one of these A tier guys and then just completely disappoint? Not with the sound of his beautiful, gravelly voice, but just in general with his performance. Yeah. So, Alex Avila, people will remember the 2018 season in which Alex Avila hit 165. Yes, we will. And, uh, Always. Now, then and forever. And and right that was when Gambo would come on the radio every single time <laughs> that Alex Avila was in the lineup and scream, "Why is Alex <laughs> Avila playing today?" Yes. that whole thing. Yes, um, that was a good bit. Yeah, but but people forget that in 2019 Alex Avila, only 63 games, but he had a 774 OPS. He actually bounced back pretty nicely the next year 
you know, much to the chagrin of Diamondbacks fans who who wanted nothing to do with him at that point. His own father so. didn't want anything to do with him. He traded him to <laughs> us. You know that. Yeah, um, I, I don't. Uh, I I don't I don't think I I don't I'm a little hesitant to put him in the D tier. I guess is is what I would what I would say because I think offensively the numbers are clearly better than you know well, that if Tuffy goes away. I guess Robert since we Ross. don't agree, we'll leave it up to Damon. Damon, sure, yeah, Damon, what do you want to put, do? Get your input in on this. Yeah, for sure. Uh, so I was thinking about making a new tier. <laughs> oh, okay. here we go. Uh, All right, <laughs> because uh, this guy is so bad at baseball that I thought that he deserved. His own special tier. Yeah. Uh, so we're going to add a row below. Okay. Um, and we're going to call, call it, it hell. Wow. Wow. Huh? wow. That is disrespectful, okay. Damon. And, that is disrespectful. And we're going to, oh, wow. that It moved the D tier there. I did yeah. the same thing last time. Yeah. But, you know, it's nice and simple here. Look at that. Okay. There we go. That okay. seems to check out, I it think. It doesn't feel right that hell is yellow. Mm. That's a little. Yeah, but, uh, track. What, what should it be? Blue. Well, like red, is, red is S is red. S is yeah, red. that's true. Right? You're right. right. Red is kind of reserved. I don't know. I don't know what color it should. Can be. I change the color here? Um, oh yeah. There you go. Yeah, you got a little a little black action. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> no, you can't even see the letter. Uh, it's fine. He's, he can fix that part. <laughs> sure. Fix that part. Get Whatever. A little white, maybe a little red. I don't know. Whatever. Yeah, this white, is stupid, yeah. anyways. This is dumb. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Who cares? There you go. <laughs> Thanks. I appreciate it. All right. Uh, we got Kelly Stinnett. Again, another guy that was part of the Arizona Diamondbacks yeah. World Series team. Um, C tier. D tier. What are you thinking here? Yeah, I, I think C probably. Um, I would I would say a step a step up um, over over uh, Tuffy Gozawish and, and Rod Bras for sure. Snet is actually fifth on the WAR leaderboard uh, behind Montero, Miller, Snyder, and Moreno. Uh, Two point five B WAR over kind of a long period of time from nineteen ninety eight to two thousand five. It wasn't necessarily playing a, a ton of games every year, but. You know, we had a 724 OPS and 84 OPS plus. I, I think I think C is is probably the right spot. Here's a guy that a lot of people don't remember, but Chad Moeller for this team. Yeah, there you go. Very good. Uh, while he was a member of the Arizona Diamondbacks, 94 OPS plus, 1.4 B WAR. Not great, I guess, defensively, but pretty good offensively. Uh, had himself. I know he had himself at least one very good season with this team, but just forgettable like just not a name that a lot of people i think would even remember as being part of the diamondbacks at one point yeah it wasn't it wasn't a particularly long uh tenure with with the diamondbacks i wouldn't say um but yeah you know chad moeller was he was another another guy who's very very respectable right um i would lean c there as well i guess all right does that seem fair yeah that seems fair to me all right we got two guys left on this list robbie hammock and jeff mathis Jeff Mathis is another guy that really, really struggled uh, offensively. Wasn't a great hitter. Yeah, wasn't not a, a great, great hitter, hitter, but a very, very good catcher. Like, got praise left and right from the pitching staff. I yeah, I think Jeff Mathis was so good defensively that yeah, we can't. He's not in the D tier with Gozawish and Barajas, even though his offense would put him in that category. He's he's definite. He's at least C for me. You could maybe argue B just because of how how good he was defensively uh so i yeah i think i'm between those two all right last but not least uh hambone robbie hammock not a good not good offensively not great defensively but man diamondbacks fans sure do love him yeah yeah that's a that's a great that's a great way of uh great way of saying it uh i mean an 81 ops plus that you know definitely better than than a lot of the other guys here for sure uh, 0. 0. 0.0.9. Uh, sorry, I'm just looking at D war. Um, which isn't a, it's not a terrible, uh, number for D war in 182 games. And he was a part of this team for a long time from 2003 to 2011. Again, another reason why he's kind of beloved there by diamondbacks fans. There's that longevity you were talking about. Dame dog. Agreed. Yeah, there, I mean, yeah, I mean, he played, he played two games in 2011, and one game in 2006, uh, you know, nothing in 2005, 2009, or hey, 2010. Sh- so. <laughs> it's 100. You're really splitting hairs. 182 now. <laughs> games split between a lot, a, a lot, lot of, of a lot of different years. Yeah, um, yeah there. 
I mean, he he was in 2003. People forget how good Robbie Hammock was in 2003. Yeah. 282, 343, yes, 477. That was the I was about. He had a 105 OPS plus there. Wasn't quite the same. Was, wasn't quite the same the next year. Um, Elise, a uh, known baseball GM, says A tier for catching the perfect game. He did catch the perfect that's game. That's fair. That's fair. I mean, fair. That, that, the leap into the arms, that was a pretty good leap. Yeah, the leap in, in and of itself. That, yeah, that, that, that might bump that, him up a tier. It's probably S tier, right? Yeah, I think he's that's automatically S tier. For sure. <laughs> uh, so how do you factor that into his grade? Maybe uh, maybe C? Uh, I have to look at it again. Uh, we put Jeff Mathis in C. Yeah, I feel yeah, like I'd, Robbie I'd put him in C. in C. I'd put him in C. All right. Yeah. Well, there you go. There's Where would your you definitive guys, ranking of Diamondbacks catchers? Where would you guys put Chris Iannetta if he qualified? Yeah, Chris Iannetta. games away. We definitely have to give Chris Iannetta a shout Ooh. out. He didn't quite meet the criteria here. I think he caught 89 games with the Diamondbacks. He didn't oh, quite reach 100. Just shy. Uh, he was really freaking good yeah, in his was. one year with the Diamondbacks. Uh, so I would be, I mean, I guess there's the whole longevity thing. Been here for six. You know, I'm not quite sure he could have maintained. 254, uh, 354, 511 with an 865 OPS. Yeah, he was a really big part of that 2017 team. Yeah. He'd have to be at least B. I mean, I think he clearly has to be at yeah. least B. You could make an argument that uh, he was really an A tier catcher for yeah. the one for the one yeah, yeah. season that he was here. So he definitely deserves a shout out. Dalton Varsho, I think, deserves a shout out as well. Uh, he we didn't. Have he Gabby didn't catch. Him. He did not catch a hundred games with the Diamondbacks. But uh, uh, you know, if if Dalton Varsho, if the Diamondbacks had made the move from outfield to catcher and actually committed to Dalton Varsho. I guess not really made the move from outfield to catcher. He really made the, the opposite move. Um, if he had just stayed at catcher and the Diamondbacks had remained committed to that, Dalton Varsho would probably be a pretty good player. I think yeah. it was clear why that decision was made, and I think it made a lot of sense to move him into the outfield. He's so incredibly good there now, but he'd be a pretty he'd be a pretty good player. Like he would he would probably be. I would say up in the B tier on this list, at least if he had stuck at that yeah. position and gotten better at it. But yeah, he caught Cogs is saying 82 games in the chat. So he wasn't, uh, didn't quite meet our threshold here either. Also, he's an outfielder. And he's a really, really he's good. He's a outfielder. really, really good outfielder. Yeah. That's what he is now. Well, uh, we appreciate your guys's input. Uh, Tim says uh, he's bringing up Brahas home run. Look, we're not, we're not doing this over one. Good game. That the yeah, Rod Bur- we're not we're not doing this. I'm just telling you now. But negative two war during his D backs <laughs> career. It's hard to put that very, very high on the very high on the list. But there were some, you know, some good moments along the way for sure. Well, I know some of you are accusing me of wearing these sunglasses because I might have dipped into the OGs a little early tonight, and you may be accurate. But uh, whether whether it's uh, to blame us for uh, this list we put together or any of the incredibly uh crazy things i've already said two days into this week um don't blame it on ogs blame it on me wait no i meant that reverse don't blame it on me blame it on the ogs uh (laughs) by the way if you want something to blame it on check out ogs you can try out their two new products uh they got a uh all ogs naturals right now that's made with live rosin vegan gummies uh, available in a sweet clementine flavor they also have their big ogs gummy which is a mega version of peg's raspberry orange rso uh, it's like freshly squeezed juice. It's delicious. So make sure check out both of these options right now to learn more about OG's gummies and where you can find them. Head on over to ogsbrands.com or check them out at a dispensary near you. Uh, also, speaking of things being near you, there is fun. There is adventure. There is a staycation uh, that is waiting for you, and it is right near you, right here in town. You don't have to travel. You don't have to buy plane tickets and go through that whole mess. Uh, you can just head on over to Gila River Resorts and Casinos because no one does it better. They offer an authentic and immersive experience. And of course, if you want to have all that fun uh, that you can have in Las Vegas, you can do that right here with their state-of-the-art gaming floor with over 800 slot machines, 15 blackjack tables, live table games, and also Arizona's largest casino sports book. So check out all that they have to offer, including uh, just lounging by the pool, drinking a pina colada. I'm a big pina colada guy now. I miss my unlimited pina coladas that I had on the cruise, and I might just head over to Gila River Resorts uh, so that I could get myself uh, one of those, maybe by uh, hanging out by the pool. So you head over to Gila River Resorts and Casinos and let them show you what the next level is all about. You do you at Gila River Resorts and Casinos. Visit play at Gila.com for more details. Can I give one last last shout-out? 
Uh, Are you going back to the catcher thing? I am. No. I am. I'm sorry. No, absolutely I have to. Not. I have no. to because Johnny Estrada was mentioned in the chat, and we have to at least mention Johnny Estrada, who was going to be part of this tier list, and then Derek removed him. Uh, but I think it was fair. He it only played. He only played one, one season, season with the D backs. We we decided cool. that we, we wanted we wanted at least multiple seasons. But yeah, he was really good in that one season. A three hundred two batting average, seven seventy two OPS, uh, drove in seventy runs in in two thousand six. A seven seventy two OPS apparently in two thousand six wasn't even league average. That was a nine a ninety two OPS plus, which kind of blows my mind. Uh, but yes, he deserves a shout out, and and he probably would have been. I don't know, B tier maybe if, if we'd included him here. So shout out, uh, shout out Johnny Estrada. Well, if, if, if you want more of this, all of this, whatever this was <laughs> that you can't, you can't stop with the stats <laughs> and the baseball stuff, sign up for a membership at gophnx.com. Become one of our diehards. And you'll get all of Jesse's content, all of his, all of his articles that go on with all of this information and all of these statistics. You also get access to our members only discord lounge, which is the best place to be an Arizona sports fan. You get a free t-shirt from the phnxlocker.com deals with our partners, uh, discounts on events and so much more. So join us over here and become part of the family. Before we get out of here, we do have to address that USA Today released their rankings of all 30 Major League Baseball ballparks uh, this week. It was a pretty thorough uh, ranking. I, I agreed with most of it. I feel like they had uh, Globe Life Field ranked entirely too high. But like Jesse pointed out, it was still in the bottom half of Major League Baseball uh, ballparks. And it's a brand new ballpark. It should yeah, be much yeah. higher than that. It shouldn't have been 17th or wherever it was. But uh, USA Today did rank PNC Park, where the Pirates play, as the best ballpark wow. in all of Major League Baseball. Uh, the top five ranked uh, in this order, Oracle Park, followed by Wrigley Field, Camden Yards, and Fenway Park, which I feel like it all is a fair, uh, it, that's a pretty fair, thorough list. I know I was kind Solid. of mesmerized by Oracle Park. I know Wrigley Field was a religious experience for me. Uh, I've always wanted to go to PNC Park. I've never been there, but yeah, I haven't uh, been to PNC. Either. I have been to Fenway, and Fenway is again, uh, it's it's it, it, it's it maintains a little bit more of the age than Wrigley does. Wrigley, they did a good job, I think, of updating Fenway. Needs a little bit more of that love, but Fenway is still just a very historically important ballpark. So that's cool. Uh, the rest of the National League West was all right there after that, all in the top ten. You yeah, had Dodger Stadium, so you had good. Coors Field. Yeah. Yeah, uh, Pet Petco Park, I think, was six. So, so that's where the rest of the National League West was. Where does Chase Field rank, you ask? Not exactly in the, not where in the, the top fuck 10. you think it would rank. Not in the top 10, not in the top 15, not in the top 20. In the top 25, you ask? Nope, not even there. <laughs> Chase Field was ranked the 27th best ballpark out of 30 ballparks. Um, it's not any, great. Any guesses as to the remaining three that were worse than chase field yes you're right oakland coliseum of <laughs> course is the worst ballpark in all of baseball we know that that's why they're moving but they're getting a new ballpark soon i don't know if you saw it but like the scoreboards on the roof and shit uh that's going to be coming here very soon so that's gonna you know they're gonna cruise up in the rankings what's next what's at 29 tropicana field yeah not which, surprising again another ballpark you know they're gonna give tampa a new ballpark they're gonna be up there and that leaves one ballpark, Jesse, one ballpark that is ranked lower than Chase Field. Yeah, and my my we we played this game before the show. My guess was Milwaukee. Your guess was and Milwaukee. My guess was incorrect. Damon's guess was guaranteed rate field. And Damon is our big winner. Uh I don't I don't know how any outdoor ballpark aside from the Coliseum could really be ranked worse than Chase Field, but congratulations, guaranteed rate field. You did it. You yeah, did it. yeah. Wear wear that with with honor for sure <laughs> 20 27th is you know 28th right yeah 20 28th it's one yeah. of you know highly yeah. sought after spot Weird. i mean everyone knows what 29 and 30 are right so 20, everybody knows 28th yeah, is no kind doubt. of like the the big the big question there and it could be debatable i'm sure uh i don't know i've never been to guaranteed rate field maybe we need our yeah uh, chgo either. brethren to tell us uh, what they think about that place but uh yeah uh, no surprise there no surprise i mean when when you have a slum lord that won't even fix the plumbing, it's not like your apartment complex can be rated very highly. We're yeah. looking at you, Maricopa County, or at least I am. He has too much journalistic integrity to have opinions that strong, but uh, <laughs> definitely, definitely a lot that needs to be fixed at that ballpark for it to be even considered 
uh, one of the nicer ballparks in Major League Baseball. My my question, which we've come back to a lot with Chase Field, is how high can it get? You Not know, very. like like there there's only so many things you can do when you're renovating a ballpark. Yeah. And and you know, if you if you go all out, we've got the new speakers this year, we've got the new lights. If you if you knock out seats, which it doesn't sound like the D backs are planning to do, but if you were to do that, if you were to try to create as many, you know, open spaces and cool food spots, and you know, if you do all of the things and check all the boxes, how high can Chase Field get? My suspicion is that it's still not all that high. Well, when you look at some of these ballparks ranked above them and how nice they are, the gap is pretty significant. Yeah. between where Chase Field is, not to mention the fact that you just don't have, I, I don't know, like you just you just don't have the ability to upgrade it. Like even some of those other ballparks can upgrade, you know, where they're at. So uh, it's going to be a tough battle to get Chase Field to be considered one of the better ballparks in baseball. But uh, hopefully they'll, they'll continue to work at it, and I know they will. Um, and no, uh, Tim, we're not getting a new stadium. We move out of Arizona. Stop it. Stop it. Stop it. <laughs> Anyway, uh, I will say that I'm very excited that the Arizona Diamondbacks are advertising uh, a a little five-part documentary called Snakes Alive that is going to cover the chaotic run to the 2023 World Series. That premieres one week from today. So keep an eye on that for uh, on D-back social channels because that already looks like fire from the preview yeah. they posted on social. Yeah, it's it's going to be really cool. Um, I've talked with with a few, a few people behind the scenes. I'm 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 pretty stoked to see see how that turns out. Uh, I also think that I, I really hope that Jeff Gazzardo, the guy who created the whole Snakes Alive thing, yes. like he better be cashing in here yeah. in some kind of way. Yeah. Hope Season the D-backs are take, taking care of our buddy yeah. Jeff Gazzardo. Yeah, for sure. Uh, uh, but yeah, it, it looks like their their preview that they released today was was really cool, and I'm I'm sure it's going to be great. Yeah, uh, give us give us all the content. We want to live in that moment uh, all over again. Uh, I believe it was uh, Elizabeth who hadn't really gone back, or or Elise. I apologize. You guys are both very knowledgeable women, and your names both start with E and L, so I <laughs> might mix you up. But uh, I, I think I think it was Elizabeth that went back and watched. Um, uh, some of some of the World Series and talked about how painful it was, and yeah, uh, I can imagine that that's not the easiest thing. Hopefully, they do a bit a good job of inspiring us with this five part uh, mini series that they're doing. But again, keep an eye out for that. Of course, you can keep it locked to us right here on social media. I am at Cap underscore Caveman with a K. This maniac next to me is at Jesse and Friedman. Of course, the people's producer Damon Dog uh, or Dame Dog, depending on. Uh, how well you know him uh you can find him at damon dog that's d-a-w-g of course we are dames dogs bark bark, <laughs> bark, bark. <laughs> uh, uh that's not all we got though of course uh we also want you to follow our show at phnx underscore dbacks but all roads do lead to at phnx underscore sports on twitter instagram and facebook we thank you guys so much for stopping by we appreciate your time tonight uh we'll see you guys tomorrow uh again at 6 p.m in the meantime uh, have a great after or evening. I don't even know what time it is. It's yeah, the sunglasses. Derek, it's not. The it's sunglasses not, really yeah. confuse me as to what time of the day <laughs> it is. But uh, you guys have a great evening. And remember, kids, baseball is fun, but it's so much more fun when you appropriately rate Rod Barajas. <laughs> We all silly like the mayor. 